Well, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome along to this Fusion uh, 21 webinar, the, the road to zero carbon. How are we getting along? I'm delighted that so many of you uh, were able to join uh, this morning, and I know people are joining uh, all the time, and again, you're, you're also very, uh, very welcome. So it, it promises to be a, a really good uh, session. As ever, just a little bit of housekeeping um, before uh, before we start. If you're, and again, most of you are probably now very familiar with this software, but you can, if you press the orange button uh, on your screen, you can reduce uh, the panel, uh, which enables you to see more of the presentations. Um, if you're having difficulties uh, hearing us, and again, you can adjust uh, the audio uh, settings um, uh, using the uh, audio uh, panel. Though sometimes, if you're still having uh, difficulties, uh, we often find that logging in and logging back out again <laughs> um, uh, can help. Or if you've got multiple screens, again, um, uh, going back to uh, one and, and, and then the other can can also help uh, with with connectivity problems. And then the other thing in, in terms of the panel in front of you is, is perhaps the most important as far as we're concerned, which is the question panel. Um, we do very much want to uh, hear from you, so please do share your questions and or uh, comments, and we'll, we'll try and get through uh, as many as those uh, as we can during the course uh, of, of, of the next uh, hour or so. So, so, so in, in, in terms of just a very, very brief uh, introduction from me, as, as Fusion 21, we recognize really the importance of uh, achieving a zero carbon. And again, what we're trying to do is to get together some interesting uh, speakers and contributors uh, to add to uh, the debate. And again, I'm, I'm delighted to uh, introduce um, today's uh, panel uh, uh, to you. So we have uh, Noel, who's an associate at, at Ridge and, and, and really is leading uh, 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 Ridge and Partners uh, zero carbon uh, offer. And also delighted to have uh, with us uh, Richard, Richard Ellis, um, who is currently uh, the assistant uh, director um, of asset management at, at Peabody. And again, uh, Richard is going to share with us Peabody's uh, journey. And finally, uh, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, uh, John Farley, uh, who, who, like Noel, uh, John uh, heads up uh, the, the, the fusion um, frameworks uh, for our, our zero uh, carbon offer. And again, John uh, will be sharing uh, with you some of the things that we uh, as Fusion are doing. So we have got a packed program. The speakers have got um, some, some excellent uh, presentation. So I'll um, shut up now and uh, hand over to Noel to um, uh, start uh, start your presentation. So welcome again, Noel, and and, and thanks for joining us. All right. Um, good morning, everyone, and and thank you, Andrew, for the opportunity to talk in an area that I am absolutely passionate about. Um, the road to net zero carbon. So what I'm going to do today is just give you a little bit about um, who Ridge are, uh, the drivers, why we're doing this, some of the challenges that we're now facing. Um, then we'll look at um, PASS 2035, the new um, framework for delivering good quality retrofit. So Andrew, if you go to the next one. Um, next slide. Right, there we go. So this is Ridge. We're a multidisciplinary practice. We've been around now for 75 years. Um, I'm one of their chartered building surveyors working in the property consultancy team, and I am also a retrofit coordinator. Um, next slide. We cover virtually all the disciplines that you could expect. The only one I understand we don't cover is, is valuation, but other than that, we cover the lot. And we also, next slide, work in all the sectors that um, you can imagine and, and actually working in different sectors is also really useful for change of knowledge from one sector you can often use similar um, knowledge in others so if we go to the next slide right so why are we bothering to do this well we've heard a lot from scientists haven't we over the last year and what they think about the world and what they think about all sorts of things and what they tell us 
is that we're at something called a tipping point. And if we continue to reach and go extend beyond that tipping point, which they can see the way we are going could happen in the next 100 years, we will hit something called mass extinction, the sixth mass extinction, and the first one ever to be caused by humans. And what we're seeing as evidence for this is this increasing temperatures that we've been seeing, especially over the last decade. And the indications are that that will continue. And if that is increasing, how are we going to survive in a hotter climate? How are we going to be able to grow things? And at the same time, you're now starting to see the impact of hotter temperatures on our icebergs, etc., which are beginning to melt. What does that mean? Well, we're starting to see rising sea um, levels. And what does that mean for people? Well, what it means for people is that actually we're going to start to see areas that are no longer habitable. We're going to see people who can no longer grow food to support themselves. We're going to see some of the biggest migration that we've ever experienced. We're going to have, unfortunately, famines, pestilence. We can have wars. This is serious stuff. And, and equally serious is our view of other animals on this world. We, we tend to have the view that we are the only animal here and we're making a great job of getting rid of everything else that gets in our way. And that could have really dire impacts on us and could actually lead to higher disease spread. Next slide, please. So what are the drivers that are actually going to enable us to get out of this situation? Well, you all know about the Paris Agreement. Um, we set the first time some targets and significant amount of countries signed up to that. And in November, COP26, we'll look at this area again. And no doubt, confirm those challenges or set increasing challenges. In response, the government has done a number of things. You've seen the green growth strategy in 2017. In 2019, the, the government's and its climate committee sort of evaluated how far we got from 2015 and we hadn't got very far. And as a result, um, this country became the first to legislate for delivery of net zero carbon by 2050, an unbelievably tough target, as you can see from the figures there, but something we have to do. Boris has put together his 10 point plan for how we're going to deliver this. And we've also seen um, in December the energy white paper, which is interesting in the sense it paints a picture of what we've got to do first, really, is reduce our energy consumption over the next 10 years, because it's going to take time for the alternative sources of energy to bed in. Hydrogen, for example, is really some way off. But if it is to do, it's going to take innovation time. So it's, let's start from the basis of reducing energy demand. Now, to add to that, we recently had the declaration that we now need to deliver 68% reductions by 2030. And there's another factor here. We've also got to address fuel poverty and the fact that many of us struggle to be able to afford to heat our homes. And if anything, that figure has now got worse during the COVID period, period as more of us have had to spend the winters at home, heating our home. So we're going to see an even bigger impact on that going forward. Next slide, please. So what, right, so what is net zero carbon? Um, loads of definitions out there, but basically this is carbon and other greenhouse gases that result from our activities, from heating our buildings, from heating our homes, from powering our homes and buildings, from our travel, from our diet, and what's involved in actually producing our diet. We also need to consider the embodied emissions. So when you do construct a house, how much concrete has been used and what's the carbon of that concrete that's been generated, as well as the supply chain, how we've actually got that building together and all the activities that go around all have a carbon footprint, which we equally need to consider. Next slide, please. So there will also be a push from government. We need to be persuaded to do this. You know, a lot of us will sit around thinking, well, this is for something else, someone else to do. So you already will be aware that um, 
from 25, no more fossil heating will be allowed in, in new homes. And we're seeing the car industry rising to its challenge almost on a daily basis. You're hearing about a new car manufacturer coming out with its latest lines of electric vehicles. I attended a Bank of England webinar in January, and they raised the prospects of rising energy costs. Well, we sort of started to see some of that, and some of it due to initial supply, but potentially supply of electricity is going to get harder. We don't have the capacity um, it, to meet the demand, and that will see itself in higher costs. Also, the fact that carbon tax will come in. We, we don't tax fossil fuels on a carbon level. level. We will start to do that. Initially, additionally, the financial institutions and insurers are very interested in this subject. They do see this as being a huge threat to economies. And they will expect organizations they support to produce climate change stress tests. So what is that? Well, basically, I'm familiar with stress tests from a business sense, but this is putting in the risk of climate change into that business scenario. But what if your prices do go up by 20% because of energy costs or taxes? What if you're suddenly the products you produce are no longer in demand and people don't want to buy them because of their poor green credentials? And you may think, well, this doesn't affect housing stations, local authorities. But if our residents can't afford to live because of the cost, the increasing cost of eating, we may see that come out in the form of lower, we're not getting our rents in. Large organisations, and they haven't specified what, but you could imagine some of our larger local authorities and housing associations may fit in, will have to produce an annual declaration of where they are. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So we have a number of challenges ahead of us, a significant challenge in terms of housing, where you can imagine we've got 28 million retrofit projects to do. That is an unbelievable amount, given that the majority of those really need to start work now to deliver this target of 2030. Next slide, please. So when we look at things like the cost, we don't really know what the cost of this will be at the moment. We, 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 we sort of know what our, our sector is, the social housing sector, and we know that that represents the smallest sector, and actually the most energy efficient sector as well. A study by um, Inside Housing suggested that the figure could be around 104 for social housing, 104 billion. Um, but actually, when you break that down and you start looking at some of those assumptions that were made and average cost, and then the variance between different respondents, you'll see actually that, that you need to be careful because there is the potential of double counting. If in your 10 year, 30 year plan or whatever you have, you've already budgeted in your long term asset management strategies for roof renewal, window replacement, heating renewals, then you've already got costs factored in and you don't want to be double counting them. But you do need to understand what they are and, and start um, identifying exactly what it is. So we can go to the next slide. So there will be support, funding support. Um, many of you will have heard um, of the, the Green Homes Grant. I've got to say, not had the best of starts. Um, half a billion pounds of that is directed through to local authority distribution. Um, uh, and that's been managed by uh, five energy hubs dotted around the country. It is really tailored for um, fuel, uh, low, low um, earning residents and, and, and people who, who can't afford and have heating levels or EPC levels below C. Um, it's open to anyone. It's open to housing associations to get their allocation as it is uh, the Joe Public in the street. The other one is the 3.8 billion social housing decarbonation fund, and that will be given in waves, uh, a full waves over the next decade. Eco, now Eco, uh, the current version is due to end in 22, was uncertainty whether or not it would be continued. From what I hear, there will be a further um, Eco launch in a year or two, um, so there'll be money available there. You have other sources such as the domestic heat and renewal, and that's typically for schemes like heat pumps 
and it's an incentive for you to actually purchase them given the, the highest higher current cost there's also tons of banks out there desperate to give money uh green finance they see this has been very popular the, the lenders of banks are very keen that um, the money is going in the right direction so you're going to see that and there still exists the private green home deals the government one ended in 2014 but there's still a the numbers doing that next slide please timetable then so we haven't got long um we need to get our properties to a band c by 2030 and that's really going to focus on reducing energy demand um so we're talking fabric first measures you'll see though that over 400 local authorities have declared climate change emergencies um, and many of those have decided that they want their stock to be net zero carbon by 2030. In fact, the whole authority. That is an immense target. Well done, them. But there's got to be a little bit of thought about what that means. And um, I've, I've already mentioned the 68 cent reduction target. And then the question posed is, do you actually know what you've got to do? And you've also now got to make sure it's shown in your business plans. Are you putting it in there um, so that you can evidence that you do have a pathway and you are resourced to do it? We can go to the next slide. So when we think then about the quality, Retrofit has a terrible reputation. Um, it was summed up in this publication in 2016, Each Home Counts, which looked at some of the previous retrofit schemes, not around the country from grants or whatever, and identified some serious failings and, and made 27 recommendations that would need to be done to restore confidence in the consumer and also confidence in the finance to deliver this. So next slide, please. So when, when you talk about properties and if we can go on a couple yep that's it um so if we we talk about the risk that we've got to consider you would typically look at that street and you look at those properties and you would typically think to yourself well they're, they all look very similar um probably got the same sort of heating in there they've all got gas and they'll all be the same but actually when you go into it and you start doing the assessment of energy you'll find they're all very different. Maybe they've got different forms of heating now. Maybe they've insulated, maybe they haven't. Maybe their lifestyle is different. Some work, some at home all day, you know, that sort of thing. You have to consider all those factors. There are other risks. If we go to the next slide. People do not like retrofit. It's, it's a factor, it's a barrier that we've got to get over. And certainly we're not there to destroy the heritage of our country in terms of, you know, listed buildings and conservation areas. So that has to be taken into consideration, as does the planning. And it has taken me a long time on some of the projects I've been involved in to get planning permission. You need to understand where the local authority is coming from, work with the local authorities uh, to deliver. That will take time. You also need to properly assess the structural condition of your property, identify where the risk elements are. Do you really understand the heating levels, the energy uses, the risk of things like overheating? What about ventilation? I mean, I, I, I know well from the 80s when we first started putting in new PVC windows, they were great, but all of a sudden we were getting mold damp everywhere because we hadn't considered the ventilation. And it's not only about extracting air, it's about bringing in fresh air. Poor design has been a feature often on retrofit schemes where you're just relying on manufacturers recommended, recommended details and they don't quite fit with your particular building. Um, often the wrong measures have been used or in the wrong order. Poor workmanship, there hasn't been a proper handover of what the design is and what the contractor's got to do. Very poor commissioning of schemes and the handover to the resident has been very difficult. And no one's actually spoke to the resident and given them to understand their fear. If we go to the next slide. So when it goes wrong, it goes very wrong, as we know. And that's the reputation that we have got to sort out. And of course, the worst one, which was a retrofit scheme, is there on your right. If we go to the next one.
So what is the solution? Well, three years after each home counts, British standards published past 2035. And what they'll be at pains to tell you, it is not a new standard, it is a framework for delivery of good quality retrofit. To back this up, they wanted a quality mark and Trustmark were chosen to be that managers of quality, quality. And you have to sign up to them and they have a code of practice and a customer charter. The code of practice adopted is past 2035 for the technical side and past 2030 for the installers. And from July, all government funded retrofit schemes will have to comply with this. But I also believe if I'm a funder, I will look for some form of quality assurance and I will probably want to use past 2035 as that quality. We can go to the next slide. So what are the main principles that we are looking to achieve through past 2035? We want proper accountability. Someone is responsible for what has been delivered and has to be accountable and seen it all through. You'll hear the term the whole house retrofit. It's no longer sufficient to do individual little measures. You need to be thinking across the whole building what works. And it becomes bespoke because each property, as I've shown you earlier, is different. Each will have different risk paths also to be considered. We have to address the ventilation issue. If you're insulating highly, think about the ventilation. Reduce the defects really getting to understand and restoring that trust and as i said fabric first is also a key to delivery next slide please so the top 10 impacts you've got five new titles so you're going to have a retrofit advisor an assessor coordinator designer installer evaluator each of those plays a key part in the delivery of a quality retrofit product. You're going to be looking at deep assessment, not just the old fashioned RD, SAP, EPC. You're going to need a lot more data. And one of those additional gathering of data is understanding the customer, what his expectations are, what his lifestyles are like, which will impact on the outcomes. The retrofit coordinator is really there to make sure all of these, this framework, these activities are, are closely linked together. And it'll also um, heavily look at the risks that are involved in doing retrofit and try to identify and address those. If we can go to the next slide. The other impact that they will be looking at, another term that you will now start to get used to is the medium term retrofit plan. And the idea is that each of those is produced from a property or a block, if you're dealing with the larger block, which gives you an indication of what measures are recommended and in which sequence they go to minimise costs and, and increase benefits. And it's very much the importance of a design input. Actually, we're looking now for our architects, our building surveyors, our SIPC engineers, really to get involved in working on design that's identifying those difficult things and making sure then the seamless design and insulation is done by connecting up with the contractors so they clearly understand what it is they're dealing with. Then we're into things like the soft landing. Um, making sure it's properly handed over, properly handed over, um, and the resident understands what it's getting. Finally, there's a stage of monitoring. You, you, you've got to understand that what you put in, does it actually do what it said on the tin? You've got to check for this. And you've also then got to evaluate where it doesn't do it anymore. And there is a process involved in evaluating. If we go to the next slide. Other risks, there is a lack of capacity. There, there is a, a need apparently for 20,000 retrofit coordinators. and We've probably got 500 at the moment. They've still not been given the priority it needs. Well, all right, we've been distracted this year, but this decade we need to make a difference. We need now to make it one of the primary business objectives of housing associations, local authorities, etc. We don't really understand our stock sufficiently well to really understand what's involved. And there's also at the moment a lack of adequate resources and supply chain. That demonstrates itself actually in the Green Homes Grant. 
And the government, for all its energy and what it's produced, has still not really produced a proper na uh, national retrofit strategy, and we desperately need one. Next, please. Finally, what I'd also say, don't add to your burden. You, you, you're, many of you will be planning or doing new build. Yes, there is the future home standards that will come in, and you'll have this uh, carbon zero um, red eco or zero carbon ready approach. But but just think on, there will be an uplift in the uh, building regulations this year that they're committed to, but you do not want to end up with a new building where you're going to need to go back and retrofit in the near future. That is a likelihood if you don't take this seriously. And it is estimated that the retrofit will cost three to four times as much as it would have cost to put it in the insulation. If we go to the next slide. So I'd also say to you, don't just think retrofit. To deliver this, we've got to think of all aspects of sustainability and delivery. So get on top of everything. Finally, we're here to help. This is our team. We have a dedicated sustainability team. If you need any assistance, please get in touch. Next slide. That's the team. And we're in a hurry, so we'll go to the next one. And just finally, thank you. This is a real challenge now. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Noel. That's uh, yeah, really, really interesting and a, and, a, and a great start. So conscious of time and, and therefore without uh, further ado, um, I'm going to uh, hand over to Richard. But just before I do so, thank you to those who have uh, uh, sent in some questions. We've got a note of those. We'll, we'll continue to take a note of the questions and then we'll deal with them um, at the end of the uh, presentation. So uh, over to you, Richard. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so, as you, uh, I'm from Peabody. I'm the Assistant Director for Asset Management. Hopefully, well, not hopefully, in about three weeks' time, I'll be Director for Sustainability. I'm actually forming a, a team of 10 people just to deal with this question and to start putting in the things that we need to do. We came up with a strategy. It took 18 months to work out. A lot of data has gone into it. Um, it sets the process and the priorities that we need to do for 30 years. As I'm sure all the asset managers out there know, we deal with 30 year programs all the time. It was the right time to do it. If we're going to get there to, by 2050, now's the time we need to start planning for it. Just as an introduction to Peabody, formed in 1862, um, we've got 66,000 homes across London and Southeast. We've got an awful lot of Victorian stuff, and if you if you know people at all, the heritage estates, as we call them, those uh, yellow stock bricks, six-storey, big tenement blocks, is uh, you can be found all the way through central London. Uh, we have a clear vision for the future in terms of investing up in our homes. Uh, obviously, fire safety and building safety at the moment is paramount, and then improving our services and developing new social housing for about 1,500 homes a year. Now, as you can see here on the next slide, the, uh, we shows our distribution. We're heavily uh, into central London, uh, though we have um, for new developments. We tend to move out into Essex and Kent with Thamesmead, um, and then we've got a few bits and pieces in Surrey and Sussex. Next slide, please. As Noel said, there is a huge uh, task ahead of us. If anyone has the time and the interest, I would recommend they have a look at the RICS webinar on valuing the planet as well. That really put, brings it out in quite a stark way, but shows how we can help. As you know, if we don't act, it's going to get a lot hotter. At the moment, we're, on, we're, we're not on track for any of the protocols that we want to do. Um, and just think about it, if we're talking about an average uh, uh, increase of four or five degrees, some places are going to get to eight degrees increase by uh, 2100. People like Singapore, if things carry on the way they are, will have an average temperature of 40 degrees. You're getting to a point where people can't live in those places. If you look at the, uh, sorry, it's a quite a busy um, slide this one but if you look at the bottom uh, you can see the amount of changes that we need to make heating has got to come down so it's transport electricity though that is coming down quite quickly 
aviation, agriculture, and then waste. Um, the reason why, I just a, a sort of personal story for a second. If you take my family, my wife thinks it's too difficult and doesn't want to know. She doesn't want to hear about it. It's all just a bit too much. If you take my kids, my kids are already starting to think about this. They're already sitting there, uh, reducing what they what they use. My eldest daughter doesn't buy um, new clothes anymore. She has second hand clothes because she thinks it, it's bad and we should be sharing more. My daughter, my youngest daughter, sat down with me on the uh, well on the Australian fires were on and said, Dad, you are going to do something about this, aren't you? And if we don't do something about it, us as, a, as an industry, who is going to do it? We have the ability to start making a change. It will take a lot longer than certainly, I, well, I hope, I'll be retired before we get to there, but we have to set the, the groundwork for what is going to happen beforehand. Next slide, please. Again, so here, this shows in terms of households, how much we've got to reduce and how we've made some of the simple gains from 1990 to 2017, but how far we've got to go to 2050. Heating, again, heating is that is a big one. They're obviously on the supply side in terms of electricity, there have been huge gains and savings, but we've got so far to go. We need to be able to power down, so reduce our use, um, and that be that through uh, fabric improvements through behavior through just making our our plant work more efficiently and then power up those renewables next slide please so in terms of peabody so as part of the strategy we've worked through we we've done a company called shift in that some of you may have heard of uh, to have a look about what our um, annual emissions were so this is for 2018-19 74%, as you would expect, is from our rented stock. That's all of those boilers, uh, chucking away, all of the work we do in terms of maintenance as well. And then you've got 25% is actually the act of building those new homes, uh, which I'll come back to later. But it's a significant portion. Now, that was on based on 1,200 homes that we delivered that year. But that was 25% of what we do. And then 1% of it was uh, facilities and uh, our data, our day-to-day -day activities. So that puts us along the slight size of Hastings County Council. That's that's our impact, and that's every year. Or as somebody else usefully uh, put up, just imagine 200,000 elephants, or about a ton each, floating in the air. That's what we're producing all the time. Next slide, please. So we've got three key targets. Uh, net zero carbon within our day-to-day -day business operations by 2030, net zero carbon within our rented stock uh, by 2050, and then to be ready to take up financial incentives and grants to make the lives better for our residents. Our residents are going to see increase in costs. Um, we know already, especially with the pandemic and the, and the issues that people had around keeping their jobs or being on furlough, it's going to be a real struggle for them. And we need to make sure that we can reduce fuel poverty as much as possible and reduce the amount that people are paying on their bills. Next slide, please. So in terms of our net zero carbon, what are we doing for our offices? Uh, we will be moving to a, a, an all electric fleet. Uh, cars have come down massively in price. Range has gone up for electric cars. It's quite incredible what's happened over the last couple of years. So we'll be transitioning as leases uh, complete, we will be transitioning across. We are looking to create a zero carbon office space. We are actually closing down a couple of our main offices, moving so that most people are working from home um, and then re retrofitting our existing uh, head office. So we're trying to be more flexible and work with people as we have shown from the pandemic, people can and will work from home and want to. So we're hoping that we can create a more flexible and more environmentally friendly office but we can get rid of some of the bigger offices we do, which gives us a saving, in, obviously, in terms of, of cash, um, but it also means that we're more flexible. We're also going to embed sustainable office procurement, so we have uh, rules around what we're trying to do and trying to get in there scope two and scope three um, 
sorry, scope three uh, emissions from our supply chain. We have a thou over a thousand suppliers. If we can use our influence on them, we can widen the spread of what we can do. And then we'll be looking to offset any emission, uh, residual emissions. We have over 250 hectares of open land, over 30,000 trees. At the moment, we think that we offset about half of what we produce, but we will be looking to green up more of our estates. As car use goes down, especially in the centre of London, we'll be looking to, uh, yeah, to green those up, to take flat roofs, make those into green roofs. So we're increasing what we're trying to, uh, trying to do and make the local environments better. Next slide. So with our housing stock, now I know that uh, Noel talked about 2030 and getting to EPCC. We don't think we're going to get there. Um, we have over half of our stock is below EPCC. Um, the figures that we have at the moment um, suggest that it's going to be tough for us to do it. And also, when we're talking about where we want to be by 2050, we want to have an average of an EPCB rating. Some of the properties in EPCC, or to get uh, some of our properties, won't get up to EPCB. So we have to look long and hard about what we're going to do with those. But what we are going to do is we'll make sure that one of the quicker wins that we're trying to do at the moment is that all our residents and our customers, so that's leaseholders, shared owners, uh, will be offered energy saving behavior advice by telephone or by visit or just through uh, our web pages. If we can help them reduce down their uh, energy use, it's just, it's gonna be the cheapest thing that we ever do. With existing properties, we're prioritizing the E to Gs at the moment. Uh, we have got, as I said, about 6,000 properties which are Victorian tenement blocks. We're doing a complete evaluation on those estates. What do we need to do and how do we need to do it to make them fit for the future, for the next 50 years? At the moment, they, they, they're expensive to heat, but in the summer, they are unbearably hot. So we've got to work out how we're going to do that. So we've set up a project for two years, just looking through that. We're also then through that going to be talking to English Heritage into the planners to see what can we do with these? Because we have projects at the moment where we're trying to put double glazing in, but because the conservation officer says, no, he wants single glazing in there, we're really struggling. So we're gonna to have to work with all those parties to try and get something to retain the heritage of our buildings, but to move them on. Uh, we're also going to improve our communal heating systems. Again, the stuff that we're getting through at the moment is 45% efficient. That's just not good enough. We're wasting money in terms of uh, not getting the efficiencies. Our customers are paying bills that are too high. We should be able to make that better. We're also, we, we, will, we will be installing insulation and low carbon heating and hot water systems. And um, the other thing that we're going to do, which again makes it difficult for us to hit the EPCC target for 2030, is that we are going to have to, and we're going to have to combine our investment programs with energy efficiency measures. It's the only efficient way that we can work out how we're going to do it. Going back to Noel's point around doing everything as a, as a whole house, what we will do is we will generate a plan for each property and we will do things in the right order, it just may mean that we won't do it in one hit. When we have done these, prob uh, these, these works before on the TSB grants and various other retrofits we've tried, doing it with people in situ is really tough, especially if you do everything all at once. So we're gonna have to work with that and work with our residents to find out what the level of the uh, invasion into the home is and how much they can do and how much we can do together to do as much as we can but equally stay within our financial controls that we have and everyone's facing at the moment. We've changed our energy procurement. So in terms of energy procurement, we buy uh, renewable electricity um, and we're managing it much better. Previously, it was on the side of somebody's desk in procurement. We've now got a team of three people who look at our energy. Are we, are we buying it in the right way? Are we billing out in the right way? What's our efficiency? Are we being as efficient as possible? So making that plant as efficient as we can, and then having a decarbonisation policy for when that plant is finished, in 10 years time when that CHP plant has closed down, we will then be ready to get in that lower carbon or zero carbon option. 
And then the other thing, obviously, is to improve our bio biodiversity. As I said before, we've got huge amounts of open land, gardens, and and the state and the state environs. So we need to make sure that we're tying all that together to make sure that the, as things get hotter, we're changing the planting. Uh, we get people involved in that. And one of the things that we have seen certainly, and I'm sure you have as, as well, is that people really value that open space, especially in the, over the last year. And we want to make that better for everyone. Next slide, please. So in terms of new homes, we're ensuring that all new developments from uh, are at least uh, EPCB and from 2021 in terms of design, because it, it takes so long to, to wind these out, they will be SAP 86. We're also looking to make sure that they have sustainable construction requirements and we will undertake a whole life carbon costing for each scheme. It is our hope on some of our larger flagship schemes that actually over the lifetime of that project, we will be carbon negative. So we will be taking more carbon out than we produce. Uh, we also ensure that obviously in our home guides, we've got energy advice, water, waste, and we are linking people with sustainable um, transport. But we're trying to do this in a project by project approach. Uh, we are fortunate that we are looking at larger projects these days rather than smaller ones. So we can really take our time to make sure we've got something as good as we can. Uh, the BBC project, we'll be looking to put down a, a ground source heat pump. It, we, it enables us just to, to plan those things through and to make a positive impact. As Noel said, we don't want to go back, and I certainly don't want to go back in 15 years' time and have to retrofit because they haven't quite uh, made the grade. Next slide, please. In terms for, for our residents, We've got resident behavior change. So obviously we're tailoring our energy, our advice sessions, and then we're going to be monitoring that to see how that how that's working. If it's working well, great. If it's not, we'll start tailoring the advice and having a look at that. We have an average of 10% saving. Um, and normally through our energy switching, we can normally save people on, on average 150 pounds on their bill as well. Um, we are looking to re definitely to reduce uh, fuel poverty, so we'll be targeting uh, the people we believe are at risk quite heavily in the first in the first year, and then we're offering out to everybody else later. We will be looking to create some um, resident champions and partner with other organisations to have local solutions. If we don't uh, talk to our residents and get them involved it's not going to work. We can do everything prescriptively, but people will, if people aren't on board, they will just open the windows more or they will not do their recycling. We've really got to bring those guys in to make sure. And, that, and if we can come up with, and they know their estates better than we do. So if we can come up with those local solutions, we'll have a better output in the long term. Next slide, please. So, what does it come down to and what i'm going to be doing for the next year is looking at our data if i have got if the data's not right i'm not going to produce that plan for each property i won't be able to link it to the asset management plan i won't be able to sort my procurement out and get the right things and i won't be able to go to grants so currently i'm talking to some of the funders and saying there are there are two ways that we can do this one you can give us eco funding and have your own suppliers deliver but two, what I really want to do is I want to come to you with a plan for two years in that area and say, this is what I want to do. This is what can you get me? How can we lever in the funding so that I can deliver more at the right time? But it all comes down to data. If we haven't got that right, we can just forget it. So this is from uh, Parity Projects. I'm sure some of you will be familiar um, from Chrome. So it enables us to model and give us some financial modeling about how we're going to get from EPC, D, E, F, up to EPCB, which is, go is going to cost us hundreds of millions of pounds over the next 30 years. Next slide. So what we have done, because um, everyone likes a, a three-year plan, we've, del we've delivered a, a three-year plan, which is focusing on data and analysis and planning and the energy advice for our residents. We've then got behind that a five-year plan, which then starts, we start seeing then the investment uh, at scale uh, with our poor, poorest performing stock, because as Noel said again, um, 
the supply chain's not quite there. It will be there, but it's not at the moment. We need to do an, all lot, an awful lot of work working on our data. We then need to do a lot of work around getting the supply chain ready, and then we start needing to roll that out. So at year five, I, I see us really moving quite quickly. And at year 10, I think that actually it will be part of what we do. It will just, it'll be a, a, a thing that we do um, in terms of asset My hope is that it will just be part of the asset management program for the existing homes. For the new homes, we'll be looking at the new technologies that come in. Um, and we will hit net zero carbon well, by the day to day activities by 2030. I think that might be it for me. But yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, thank, 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 thanks very much, uh, Richard. Just, just, just one quick question, and I will come back to the uh, to the questions. But somebody just asked, uh, and I, I just wondered if you could repeat the name of the software dashboard that you were just showing us. Uh, it's Parity Projects, and it's Chrome is the software. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I'm now going to hand over. Uh, to my colleague um, John Farley, who, who is again, as I said at the beginning, we'll we'll just talk about uh, Fusion's uh, Fusion's journey. So over to you, John. Okay. Thank, thanks, Andrew, and uh, also thanks to Noel and Richard. Uh, very interesting uh, presentations there. Um, so really, just a couple of slides from from Fusion 21, just to touch on what we're actually doing at the moment from a procurement perspective, um, in terms of delivering net zero carbon. So. Currently, we've got various projects ongoing, um, local authority decarbonisation schemes, um, green homes grants uh, projects, um, also on a fabric first approach, as identified by, by Noel in his presentation, but we've also got other stuff going on that's supplementing that in terms of um, heat pumps and solar PV. Um, we're also involved in public sector decarbonisation schemes. So from the Salix funding, so that's actually covering corporate stock, um, which is leisure centres, office space, um, probably a little bit more detailed in terms of what measures are actually being installed. So we've got a, a, a still a fabric approach on that, um, but more some detailed m and &E equipment going into that, LED lighting. Um, and some lighting and, and, and BMS and control systems for the equipment that's being installed. Um, we're also involved with a number of capital investment programs. So some of the longer term delivery um, projects, which are again, fabric approach. So we've got some big projects going on in Northern Ireland and in Scotland, which are, are looking to obviously address the, um, the energy ratings of the property from a fabric perspective. We're also involved in a number of solar PV schemes for uh, corporate assets, um, for obviously looking to to for renewable energies from that side of things. Um, also involved in solar farms. So we've got a couple of solar farm projects uh, on the go. Um, and then also some innovation uh, around ground source heat pumps, but in particular water source heat pumps as well. So all these type of projects are um, being currently delivered through the, the frameworks. Um, so the frameworks, they're OGU compliant. And if anyone's listening today who is not currently a Fusion 21 member, um, I'll just let you know that it's actually free to join and become a member of Fusion 21. And our membership terms and conditions can be found on our website. OK, so I just wanted to uh, put in some context around the um, the energy efficiency and the approach um, from a time, cost and quality context and the principles behind that, which I'm sure in the construction sector we're all familiar with. Um, but in particular around some of the energy projects that we've been delivering, funding timescales have been very tight. Um, a lot of the works have got to be completed by the 31st of December this year. Um, some of those uh, timelines have been extended albeit there's still tight timescales to actually deliver that. So from a procurement perspective, it's really important that we um, enable our members to be able to get projects to site uh, with a chance of delivery uh, for them to be successful. So the frameworks actually permit a, a, a compliant direct award to suppliers, so that early supplier involvement is possible through our frameworks. Um, we also recognise that 
no, that's not not for everyone. And sometimes the governance will require a further competition. Uh, again, that is something that we can also assist our members with. So having a pre-existing framework um, will also save time uh, and enable you to get to site and deliver the project and, and give you more time uh, and more chance of success of, of hitting those tight timescales that are currently in place. Um, from a cost perspective, um, we all know ensuring value for money in the public sector is paramount. Um, and, and the frameworks are actually set up um, and provide a comprehensive schedule of rates for each of the potential measures you'd be looking for. So I take external wall insulation as an example that we've got, it's based upon an archetype whole house approach. So we've got square meter rates for different types of finishes on, on, on external wall insulation for silicon render or pebble dash render. Uh, for solar PV, we've got different size systems up to four kilowatt. If you're looking at corporate stock as well, then we actually go up to, to around 100 kilowatts on that as well, if um, if that's what you're looking to, to sort of deliver across your corporate assets. Heat pumps as well, they are also uh, based upon archetypes, size of properties, number of bedrooms. So we've, we've basically got a lot of cost information there, which will enable the value for money side of things to, to be achieved um, if that was the desired option to, to do a direct reward route. Um, I think it's also worth um, mentioning that given the fact that there's so much money out there now and so many uh, schemes, uh, local authorities looking to deliver um, fabric measures and, it, and, and PV and whatever, there is a demand on the supply chain. Um, so one of the benefits actually of using a framework is obviously being able to access those rates. Um, as demand goes up, potentially costs will go up. There's also potential issues with um, resource of material and labor because everyone's trying to deliver projects at the same time. So actually coming to a framework to use that a pre-existing agreement enables you to have that quick start, get involved, get the point of supply from the outset, and then obviously ring fence that material and supply chain to make sure that you're able to achieve your, your, your delivery targets. I think also as well, from a quality aspect uh, and just uh, what we're doing at, at, from, from Fusion 21 in terms of the procurement and, and just to touch on some of Noel's points around some of the quality issues around retrofit. Um, as part of setting up the framework, we've actually subjected the supply chain to a, a rigorous um, assessment in terms of the capability and resource. So through the ITT stage, they've had to submit a, a, a peak a, a PAS 91 specification. Part of that is for them to demonstrate that they've got previous experience of delivering similar projects. They've got the capability. Um, we've also asked for references as well. So we're actually testing to see that, you know, what they're saying is correct. Um, we're looking for accreditations particularly. So, so on a pass fail basis for insulation measures, we're looking for our suppliers to have uh, past 2035 or past 2030, but now work to 35 at least. Um, for heat pumps and solar PV, they have to demonstrate that they've got the MCS accreditation as well. So from a procurement angle, we're actually looking to pre-qualify the supply chain and put it in place um, to meet our members' demands and requirements, um, which, which are pretty high at the moment. Um, so from a framework, aspect as well. It's also, I'll touch on the framework agreement. Um, on the call-off contracts, this may vary from member to member depending on, on the actual delivery model, but the frameworks are flexible to allow you to use a particular contract that will suit your delivery requirements. Um, a quite popular um, route now is to a measure term contract, which permits or provides some flexibility where um, you may not necessarily have the asset list ready from the outset um, and you haven't identified the properties, particularly around the, the green home schemes where, where you've been allocated a budget, but you haven't identified the properties yet. So the measure term route gives that flexibility for, 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 for contracts to, to be amended, admissions and, and, and additions around the actual delivery tie it back into the framework itself and they're based upon property rates for, for each of the measures as well. So there's that degree of cost certainty provided up front for, for before you actually go into the contract as well. Um, 
it's also important to mention that I know a lot of um, the government's requirements are around the use of local supply chain, uh, stimulating the economy. So the framework agreements do actually have in them um, where we encourage um, our supply chain to use local suppliers where necessary or where possible. So take, for instance, where there's EPCs or scaffolding, uh, m and elements of the work, where possible, our, our, our uh, suppliers are encouraged to use local suppliers to, to stimulate the, the local economy. Um, so, so in that respect, that early supply involvement, it also can promote the innovation around um, new technologies, and then also giving you the ability to, to make sure that you've got that time up front to uh, ensure your design is correct and, and obviously complies with the requirements under, under PAS 2035. Um, it's also worth to mention that, that as part of the framework agreement as well, um, we've got social value embedded within that. So there is an obligation upon our appointed suppliers to deliver social value outcomes. Um, just to give you some examples around that now with the, some of the social delivery plans that we're, we're, we're putting in place. Um, we're looking at resident liaison offices from employment opportunities, but then there's also an educational piece of work that we're doing with local colleges. Obviously, that's all being done remotely at the moment, but it's about educating people um, around the, the benefits of, of, of reducing their energy consumption and, and, and obviously the road to, to zero carbon as well. Next slide, Andrew, please. All right. OK, so just to touch on, I'm not going to go into detail in terms of the specific lots, but they do cover all of the, the main measures that you'd expect to see on a retrofit project. Um, the cut, um, the split across a number of our frameworks. So we've got the energy efficiency framework um, where fabric measures are in, included within that and LED lighting. Um, we've got heating and renewables with heat pumps in that as well. And then the construction works framework that will also uh, enable for public sector corporate buildings to be included within that within our offer so 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 we've pretty much covered the basis for any of our members uh, potential requirements around delivering um, zero carbon projects and then we've also got a professional services framework and consultants framework which um covers any design or or, or upfront strategy uh, that may be required um, and it's just worth noting as well that in terms of strengthening our offer we're currently looking to go out to market to um, a new consultants framework, which has a specific lot within that to deliver um, decarbonisation work. So we'll cover that uh, longer term piece of work around strategy, um, how you actually get to that zero carbon of 2030 and how you plan it in terms of the cost management, but then also the quality control aspects that you need to have in place to, to make sure that everything's delivered to the right quality and standards as well. Um, so if anyone's got any questions around that or would like to know more, we've got some user guides there. Please feel free to get in touch. Um, I think that's that from me, Andrew. So I'll, I'll hand back over to yourself. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks. Th thanks. Thanks very much, John. And, and, and thank you uh, to to Richard uh, and Noel. I, I am conscious of kind time and I, and I do know that, that people will uh, will be uh, leaving. But for, for, for those who can stay on, I think I'm going to, um, perhaps uh, have say five ten minutes of questions, and we've we've had a lot of questions. If you've uh, sent in a question and you're not a, uh, we we don't get through it, then we we will try and uh, address that uh, separately. Ask the the, the panelists to to complete a, a written assessment. But uh, but I'm just going to so, so start with 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 one of the with, with one of the questions, which which is around. You know how are we going to achieve uh, all of this and, and and the sort of uh I'm, I'm going to sort of focus a couple of questions and link them together around uh sort of the energy and and you know are heat pumps and hydrogen boilers uh, the answer and also then sort of specifically um to you richard which is around the comment you made around your uh chp schemes and, and why they were so efficient inefficient at the moment and Again, whether or not you've already started to to look at solutions. So, I'll, I'll come to you first, Richard. But then again, so in, in terms of the others, you know, is is heating going to be the uh, you know the the, the 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 silver bullet, or 
is it a fabric first um, approach? So, so, so Richard, you, you first. Um, well, in terms of the silver, but I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think it's actually fairly dull stuff that we should be doing and we can be doing all the time. Um, the, the secret is to get the fabric right. It doesn't matter how wizzy you do anything else, unless they come across and sort out fusion energy, which they've been promising for the last 50 years. It's going to be fabric, making sure we put as little energy in as we can, getting the residents on board and understanding that, and then being ready to put in the clever stuff that, that will be developed. Um, in terms of uh, CHPs and, and whatnot, why are they so inefficient? Well, in our, in our experience, what we found is that originally they were over-designed. They were designed for peak and not for average loads. So with a CHP, CHPs only really work, start working efficiently at 60%. If you design it for the peak, they never actually turn on. We have a couple of sites where the CHP is never on and they're always on gas. Also then, in the terms of the installation, it tends to be not lagged so well, so you get those warm corridors that everyone complains about um, because it's just not lagged. And then we don't we don't manage it well, and the supply chain's not quite there in terms of getting people in to actually look after these things and understand them and know them. So what are we trying to do about that is we are talking to a few, and we've only just started talking to a few people about whether or not we can uh, be more dynamic in the setups that we have and having internet controlled valves that allow us to uh, change the flow rates. Um, and get that up, having a look at our worst performing bits and pieces, and then just actually taking them apart and seeing what it is. It comes down to data, or always, sadly, as I would say that, I'm an asset manager, it always comes down to data and how, how you can do it. So you can, you attack the worst ones that you can, and then prepare for in 10 years time, for that to be swapped into something which is lower carbon. Yeah, that, thanks, no, no, no. Yeah, um, what I would say, yes, absolutely, I'm going to say fabric first. No, no doubt about that in my mind. Um, there will be innovation that's going to make it diff uh, easier to do fabric first. Um, and that we will increasingly start to see over the years. But one point I'd make, it actually is not very difficult to get to net zero carbon in housing. What we're doing is, uh, is improving our electricity grids decarbonizing it and so what we found actually during the, the summer we were able to deliver electricity without using gas or, or fuels for the first time that will step up the only problem is when we can actually make all our homes net zero carbon the question is whether the residents living in those homes will be able to afford it because the price of electricity will remain very high so that's got to be the balance, affordability, and that's why the best approach is always going to be reduce your energy needs and finding the best method of doing that. John, have you got anything you want to add? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that, Andrew. Okay. All right, thanks. So just in terms of that, again, that, that there was a question uh, around uh, uh, residents and resident consultation um, and also there's the age-old issue of, of sort of leaseholders uh, in particular. Again, I, I just wondered, you know, in terms of that, is, is there, again, have you any sort of advice uh, for the audience on how you how to involve uh, residents uh, in in the journeys uh, that, that that we're on? Noel, do you do you want do you want to go first? Yeah, I, in fact, just before I came on. The um, webinar. I, I had a call from a colleague in our London office who's got an issue with having to replace windows in um, a, a block as part of refurbishment where the client suddenly doesn't want it because a lot of the lessees are complaining about the cost and would much rather have them repaired. Um, I think this is a mindset that it, we all understand the issues of residents and leaseholders and the costs, and they are seeing some incredibly high costs due to other issues that we, we could all talk about. There has to be government support. Actually, we are on a war footing, I would suggest. We need to get into a war footing. We need actually to get interest in the country, get the message out there, and there is no excuse. And Unlike Kennedy, who could decide not to have gone to the moon 
I don't think our leaders really have an option here. We have to deliver the net zero carbon agenda because the consequences are just too great. Okay, Richard? Um, yeah, there's, there's no easy answer to it. I remember trying to do uh, an overcladding scheme and it was stopped for a thousand residents and it was stopped by three leaseholders who decided that they didn't want to do it. I think from government, yes, funding would help and um, cl but clearing the way so that planning officers will actually just let us do it so that then we can focus on the residents and persuading them that it's a good thing. It's gonna, I think for any project, it will take a year to persuade the residents and then to have them uh, to, to go back on them, make sure that we, we, we're working well and we've learned from each project. I think it's a project by project thing that we have to look, every solution is going to be slightly different. Um, but the other thing, and what we're trying to do with the energy advice service and, and really beefing that up is actually to try and just get people thinking about it. Because like my wife, and I apologize to my wife, she's not here, but that's good. Um, they, it's too difficult for a lot of people and it's too abstract. Why, if I'm worrying about my job, why, why do I care about that? You know, it's it's really difficult for people. So it, it's there's a overlaying of everything of just this is important. This is what we're doing. This is what we can help you with. So it's a multifaceted approach, but I don't think there's an easy answer to it. Okay. There, there, there was there was I'm going to have sort of one uh, there's one one quick question uh, for for you you know like Richard or or John you may also have a point of it, which is which is around the energy hubs again yeah, I think you mentioned that Noel in in your presentation do you think they've got the capacity um, to be able to deliver um, what they've been set out to, uh, to to deliver was the direct question. Sorry, I missed the first part, part of it, Andrew. Could you say it again? It, it yeah, so it was, it was about the energy hubs and whether or not they've got the uh, capacity yeah. uh, to be able to uh, deliver. I, I, I have a, yeah, I, I'm not overly impressed, I've, I've got to say, with, with the energy hubs. Unfortunately, they don't have a consistent approach in how they're delivering it. Some of them are going directly to a contractor and expecting him have to have all the tools and past. Uh, 2035 to deliver others are going through a, a selection process of getting the technical support in and then are saying but you're going to have to use our supply chain and then and then doing a bit of exercise there it isn't very clear i think it's 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 it, i i sort of get the idea of dividing the country into five and actually having a a proper hub that actually is interested in making sure the right thing is done i think unfortunately um the current that they've got is not um, that clever. The time scales for delivery are nonsense. There isn't a proper ability to properly do a whole life assessment. And equally, the funding levels for that grant, maxing at about £10,000, are tending to encourage single measures. Again, it's not a good start. So I think part of the problem, they haven't been given a good tool to work with. They will develop. It potentially has an idea, but but at the moment, no, I don't, I don't think it's working particularly well. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much. So, so I'm going to finish with some. Just, Andrew, just just to come on the back yeah. of Noel's comments there, I think sure. I think one of the biggest challenges there with the energy hubs and that is is obviously discharging this money within the given time scale scales and that and you know obviously there's a procurement required around that and obviously given that the time scales for delivery are pretty quick to set that up and actually make it realistically achievable and deliverable within that is, is going to be a, a big challenge that they're going to face so there's potentially going to be frustrations with organizations public sector bodies around actually going through that process um and actually getting someone appointed to deliver that which potentially will have a detriment to actually the delivery side of things because everything's being rushed. Um, so that's where I sort of put across today that what we're doing at Fusion 21 um, in terms of supporting our members, enabling that quick appointment, that early supply involvement to obviously get there and obviously put them in a better position to, to be able to deliver within the time frame. Excellent. Uh, that's that, that that that's that, that's brilliant. So I'm I'm, I'm it's it's now we're just after uh, ten past. So I am going to uh, wind up uh, the the 
the, the, the session and, and, and thank uh, our, uh, our three speakers. So thanks to Noel, uh, Richard and, and, and John for being here. Thank you uh, to the audience uh, for your contributions. As I said, we'll, we'll try and uh, get through the questions uh, offline and, 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 and send, through, uh, send, send through those, those responses. Um, we, we, will, we at Fusion will continue to be running uh, these webinars. We have a, one on social value uh, during the pandemic uh, next week and details of that uh, are on our website and we will be returning uh, to the road to zero carbon uh, before long. So all remains to me to say is thanks again to our speakers. Thanks to you for our audience uh, for, for being there. Hopefully you've enjoyed it uh, and hopefully um, you'll have a good rest of the day. So thanks very much uh, again and uh, good afternoon. Thank you.